So I guess I'm essentially here as the de facto voice of the unwashed masses of the public. And I'm here to provide a bit of an alternative perspective on the issue of stewardship, I hope. Uh, I'll state my bias up front, and this will be the bias of my talk. Uh, I believe that every healthcare encounter, uh, during every healthcare encounter, there are actually three parties in the room uh, the patient, the provider, and the payer. And that's what we have to juggle, is the needs and the wishes of each. Uh, every one of them has to be stewards of resources to varying degrees. Uh, but the three parties don't have equal power, and unless and until they do, they don't have equal responsibility. Uh, in the current system, where physicians have most of the power, I think, at least over resources, uh, the bulk of responsibility has to fall to them. That's not necessarily right, but that's the reality today. The payer, government, uh, or private insurers in some cases, control the purse strings, though not as much as we tend to think because of the structure of our system, so they carry a heavy burden too. And then of course, patients have responsibilities. Uh, first and foremost, their responsibility is to use services responsibly. And we don't discuss that near enough. We talk a lot about rights, but we don't talk enough about responsibilities. But we have to give them the tools to be responsible, and I, I don't think we do that either. Um, ultimately, though, in an ideal world, it should be a joint venture. Physicians, payers, and patients all choosing wisely and spending wisely. But this is Alberta, it's not Nirvana. So, you know, it's not an ideal world. In healthcare, we often talk about rights, as I said, but again, that other side of the coin is, is so often forgotten. So the question for me is this, uh, can any of the three parties really fulfill their responsibilities and have their rights respected individually and collectively within the current system? Uh, I'm not sure they can, and I think that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about systemic issues. Uh, while the focus of today's gathering is on physician remuneration, uh, there's no question that's only one aspect of a much larger uh, issue. And I'm not going to talk about fee-for-service versus uh, alternate payment plans and that. I'll leave that to the experts. Uh, but I think there's one area where there's broad agreement uh, with everyone in the room. Uh, and that's, that is that we deliver good medical care in Canada. In fact, excellent care most of the time. Anyone who's had some, a loved one in the system or has been in there themselves knows that. Uh, if you're in the right place at the right time, you get superb care. But it's getting to the right place that can be a, a perilous journey at times. Uh, too often we provide the level of care, a good level of care, in spite of the system, not because of the system. And it, it shouldn't be that way. Uh, I don't think we have real serious medical problems in Canadian healthcare. What we have are fundamental structural problems, and these come about for historical and political reasons. And Dr. Naylor touched on some of them, and I'll talk, on some, I'll talk about some more. Uh, when we cobbled together what we now call Medicare in the 1950s and 60s, uh, we fashioned it in response to the population and the political needs of the time. And we often forget that historical imperative. Uh, in the post-war years, Canada had a very young population, even younger than what Alberta is today. And that population had very few medical needs. Uh, they needed primary care, largely for the care of infectious diseases. This is around the time vaccines came along. And needed acute care for traumatic injuries and catastrophic uh, illnesses like cancer and cardiovascular disease, which were invariably fatal in a pretty short order. Uh, medicine has changed a lot since then. And the third thing people needed at the birth of Medicare was birthing services. It was, after all, the baby boom. Now, because of medical advances and cultural shifts, uh, so for example, uh, women stopped giving birth at home, they went to hospitals, this required, uh, this made care much more common and much more expensive. And there was a bit of a backlash to that. It was also an era of big government. Government was going to solve everything for everyone. Uh, politicians responded to these new needs and these new demands of the public by creating public insurance programs. And there were a whole variety of them. Uh, we know the Tommy Douglas model eventually won out over the Ernest Manning model, but there were very varied uh, approaches to this. Um, but what these insurance programs covered was hospital care first and foremost, and then a few years later, physician care. And we know the political out followed from that. Now that was totally appropriate for the time. It was politically a sound move, most of it. Uh, but 50, 60 years later, this bifurcated public system that we have uh, no longer makes a lot of sense. 
And the use of the, I'm using the technical word bifurcated, which means uh, describes the odd Medicare system we have where 100% of physician and hospital services are covered and only a fraction of everything else. Ranges from about 50% for drugs to about 4% of dental care is pub publicly covered in Canada. Uh, no other universal healthcare system in the world, and there's about 60 of them, uh, covers healthcare in that way. Uh, every Western country, with the exception of the US, of course, publicly ensures a significant percentage of all services, not just doctors and hospitals. And it requires patients to top up their contributions in various ways. So I think the essential discussion we need to have is not just about doctors' fees, but what's covered by Medicare and what's not. To me, that's a, an important starting point for any reform. Now, whenever you suggest this in Canada, and I do it often, uh, thankfully you're not armed with buns to throw at me, uh, whenever I talk about this, people say, well, you're promoting two-tier medicine. Uh, to me, that term is largely meaningless, a rhetorical term, because the reality in Canada is that we have unequal and inequitable care across the board, across a host of services. There's no two tiers, there's multi-tiers, from province to province and even within provinces. Uh, we need to recognize in policy that hospital and physician services are not sacred, uh, and they're probably not all essential, so they shouldn't be covered 100%. And the corollary is true as well, that a lot of other services are essential and should be covered if we're gonna treat everyone fairly. So when we ask this fundamental question, what's an essential health service, uh, I think it's a good starting point for restructuring. And again, you heard Dr. Naylor talk a lot about structure, and that's what I'm going to obsess about for the next few minutes I have. Um, now, I notice when I say the word restructuring in Alberta, uh, there tends to be a lot of nervous shuffling in seats. Uh, I saw a few people out there uh, de developing uh, uncomfortable facial tics. Uh, you know, to an outsider, Alberta's health system gets restructured every few months or every few weeks. We see a little article in the paper. It goes from centralization to regionalization to a different number of regions back to centralization. Not sure where you are this week, but uh, I'll ask the AHS folks at my table. But I, I'm saying this in a lighthearted way, but this dizzying pace of administrative change is, is hard to keep up with, and I know it's really difficult on both patients and employees. I, I think there's a certain amount of PTSD in the system because of all this change. And I'm not saying that jokingly, I think it's, it's quite real. But to me what's going on here is, is actually not restructuring, it's administrative deck chair shuffling, and we have to make that distinction. Uh, restructuring for me is doing something fundamentally different, not just changing the, the plaques on the doors or the number of regions, that's not restructuring. Uh, What's an example? An example of restructuring is what happened in Denmark. And I was lucky enough to go to Denmark a, a while back and look at this. Uh, in the early 80s, they had the foresight to look ahead and say, listen, we have a very aging population. This is going to change healthcare needs. We have to uh, change our system in response. So what did they do? Uh, they actually had quite a radical response. Uh, Denmark has not added a single hospital bed since the early 1980s. They've stayed stayed the course on hospital beds. Uh, they've said, instead, we're gonna invest heavily in community care, invested really big in primary care, home care, and long-term care facilities. And not massive uh, institutional care, but they tend to have small home care, uh, or sort of small uh, residential care facilities for people who, who can't otherwise be cared for in the community. Uh, they didn't spend a lot more money, but they spent it differently. And I think that's the kind of thing we have to do. Uh, in Canada, whenever we have a problem, we, we don't spend differently. What we do is we throw more money and more bodies at problems. Uh, you see that in the physician data that uh, Dr. Galley introduced at the beginning. Uh, today, we have more doctors than ever in absolute numbers and per capita, and access and waiting lists are as bad as they've ever been. So I don't think, well, that tells me the solution is not necessarily throwing more doing more of the same. And I'm not picking on doctors here, they just happen to be the focus of today's meetings. So there's a hundred or a thousand of these examples that you can pull out. Uh, the same can be said of other sectors within the healthcare system. Whenever something doesn't work, we do more of it, which, as I recall, Albert Einstein defined as, that's the definition of insanity. You know, if something doesn't work, do some more of it. And this brings me back to my central point. 
The problems we have in healthcare are overwhelmingly engineering and administrative problems, not medical ones. Uh, to reform the system, to make it more sustainable, to use the popular jargon, I think we need, uh, above all, a profound philosophical shift. Uh, like Denmark, like many other countries that provide better care at a lower cost than we do, we need to build a public insurance program and a care delivery system that's designed for the demographics of the 21st century and not for the demographics of the 1950s. Uh, every day in Canada, we're jamming a square pegs into round holes, and, and we see the consequences of it in that data, in that OECD data. Uh, in other words, before talking about sustainability and resource allocation, I think we need to decide what we want to sustain, uh, where we want to invest for our health dollars, and, and why we want to invest them there. And we don't have those fundamental discussions near often enough. Uh, there seems to be broad agreement that we don't want to sustain the status quo. I think there's a recognition it's not working that well. Uh, but despite all the talk, we do little more than fiddle around the edges. And we do a lot of fiddling. Uh, why have other countries been able to adopt extensive reforms and we have not? I'm not sure. Uh, again, th I think much of it comes down to a structure that's developed over time that's left us fairly hamstrung, makes it difficult to, Im to introduce improvements. Uh, there's no other entity in the world, not a non-profit corporation, a for-profit institution, or a government, that's structured as bizarrely as the Canadian healthcare system. And let me give you a summary of what it looks like, again, to an outsider. Uh, you have these free products, and I use the word free in quotes, health services, that consumers pay for, uh, but they really have no idea how much they cost, and they pay for them indirectly in the form of their taxes. But they have some vague idea, a bunch of their money goes to health. Uh, divisions within this entity, uh, take for example hospitals, uh, they employ workers, but they actually don't have any control over their wages or the conditions of employment. Uh, those are negotiated separately. So in practice, this means uh, they have no control over labor costs, which account for about 60% of their overall budgets. Uh, I don't think Microsoft would operate like this very well. Uh, if that were not bad enough, the workers who control consumers' access to the free products, uh, like hospitalization, surgery, and drugs, and these uh, workers are doctors for the most part, uh, many of them don't actually work for the entity. They're independent contractors, yet they have principal control over access to goods and services. Again, it doesn't seem like sensible. Uh, practically, again, this means administrators don't have a lot of control over the administration of costs. And finally, the R&D department, the all-important R&D department we call researchers, they don't work for the entity either. They are funded separately and they're funded poorly and they're not integrated into the system. Uh, most successful corporations spend about 25% of their revenues on R&D, on constant improvement. But in Canadian healthcare, uh, we spend less than 1%. And again, they're cast aside, the researchers. Now, how could anyone who examined this structure, even summarily, imagine that it would be efficient and responsive to the needs of consumers? Uh, where's the accountability in this model? Where's the incentive to improve? Where's the ability to actually manage? And how can you innovate if you have a corporate entity that has no control over production, labor costs, and no R&D budget to speak of? Um, if that weren't enough, what, what exactly is the purpose of this corporate entity we call Medicare or healthcare? Uh, what's its mission statement? I've been writing about healthcare for 30 years. I've never seen the mission statement of Canadian Medicare. Uh, the only clear goal we seem to have is to spend a little more than last year, but not too much more. And that's not a very good goal to start from. Now, I'm going to leave you to ponder some of these issues and these questions. But suffice to say, there's no shortage of opportunities for improvement. So let me close by saying that, coming back to stewardship. Stewardship for me is not just about money. It's not just about doctors. It's about embracing a philosophy and a culture that says a couple of things. It says that access to essential health care is a right for everyone. But along with that right comes many responsibilities. And one of the responsibilities is creating a structure that allows those promise or that promise of health care for all to be fulfilled. Uh, stewardship by patients, providers, and payers is about making difficult decisions and being, to put, uh, being willing and able to put a little bit of water in your wine for the greater good of everyone. So thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions for the little bit of time we have left. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, Andre. So we have time for a couple of questions before, before our upcoming break. I'll, I'll start with, with one. So I, I found your description of an outsider's view of how Canadian healthcare is structured to be particularly powerful because it does, it does certainly draw our attention to how can this be and how did it end up like this. How do we begin to undo the knot that we're in? What's the first step? Yeah, so whenever, whenever I ponder that, I think, you know, how did other countries do it? What's magical about uh, what a country like Denmark or Holland has done that Canada hasn't done? And I was once in, uh, I was in the Netherlands and I was talk talking to the health minister and they had just done this dramatic reform. They had gone from an entirely publicly funded insurance system like Canada to one that's entirely privately, uh, it's all private insurance and it's strongly regulated and so on. So I said, how did you do something so dramatic uh, and not, you know, and survive? The government survived. And he, he looked at me in a very puzzled way and he said, well, uh, you know, our bureaucrats studied the issue and they found this was more efficient, so we implemented it. And I was like, whoa, wow, that's weird. <laughs> uh, but, but it said a lot to me. He, he, was, he was truly puzzled that, you know, if you have all these people, these experts that work for you, why don't you take their advice? That's the role of politicians. And, you know, over the years, I've, write, I've written around healthcare for about 30 years now, and I used to be very critical of politicians. Oh, they're not leaders, etc. And I've realized over time that good politicians actually lead from behind. They realize what's the public willing to, to accept, uh, what advice can I sell? You know, they'll do whatever is, is palatable for the public. And we, we, I don't think we present in an information or give them the tools to do this. Instead, we have sort of this constant bickering between various parts of the sector. But, you know, the central point, I think, is we don't empower our uh, leaders to, to actually lead. That, that's what I learned in that, that Dutch example. Do you have any, any thoughts or comments about the UK that, uh, interestingly, a couple of observations. One is that they opened the 2012 Olympics with a, a big celebration of the National Health Service as, as a source of national pride, which is something that we Canadians have often done in celebrating Tommy Douglas. Um, but any, any thoughts or comments on why the UK is, which is really number one on many of the Commonwealth Fund metrics, what did they do? Has it always been like that or was there a, was there a transition? I sense that had the Commonwealth Fund work done, been done 20 years earlier, the UK and the NHS wouldn't have been number one. Yeah, so I think the UK, like Canada, is having, they're having a lot of troubles now. There's a lot of upheaval in that system, as in everywhere, because of financial pressures. Uh, I think it's easier for the NHS because it's a central system, to be honest. We will never have that benefit because of our, the quirks of our constitution. We have to live with that. Uh, so I think they have technical advantages uh, that they've exploited. Uh, I'll tell you what I thought about the Olympic thing. I thought it was... Uh, I, when I was watching that, I was thinking they have the same problem as Canada. Is they really mythologize this whole health services thing. I think uh, providing health care for all is important, but getting all romantic about a, an insurance program is not something I do personally. And I, I think we do too much of that. We say, oh, Tommy Douglas is the greatest Canadian hero. Yeah, he was great, but that was the 1950s. Now it's 2016. Uh, Tommy Douglas would not create the health system today that he created in the 1950s or that he was part of creating. And he wasn't alone, and he made a lot of political compromises and so on and so forth. So I think we have to stop uh, mythologizing our history and recognize some of its shortcomings and that it's given us good things, but it's given us a lot of bad things, including our feet being in cement about change, unfortunately. So I, I would romanticize him a lot less personally. And not that he's last, not a bad, not that he's not a good guy. But <laughs> one last, uh, yeah, one last question. Yeah, short questions. Bill Fall, uh, Healthcare Can. Andre, you talked about sort of this three-legged stool, patients, uh, uh, providers, and payers. Um, you've spent a lot of time talking about the physician and the providers and, the, and now the politicians. What about engaging in, and uh, um, and uh, involving uh, patients more in that, uh, in that trilogy, that three-legged stool? Could you think, elaborate on that, please? Yeah. So, I, you know, that's a popular theme today. Let's talk patient-centered care. Let's get patients involved. I think that's a good thing, and I think it's important. But I think it has, we have to recognize it has limitations. The reality in the real world is most people don't think about healthcare until they're sick. 
And when they're sick, they don't have the time, the energy, or the ability to be fully engaged. So there, you know, they, there is a three-legged stool, but one of them needs a, a lot more propping up, and that's the patients. So I think uh, expect something of patients, expect individual responsibility, and uh, expect uh, groups to be involved of various sorts, but I, I don't think we can just dump everything on patients and say, you fix it, which is sometimes the impression I get. Uh, the other thing, the biggest beef I hear from patients, uh, because it's, there's a mania now for let's involve patients, let's put them all on our board, is when I talk to patient uh, advocates, they say, you know, everybody else around the table is getting paid, and I'm a volunteer. It's this uneven power balance. So I think if you want to engage people, you have to actually treat them more fairly as well. So maybe pay them for your board meetings, recognize that their time is valuable. It's not just because they were sick with cancer once that you know, they have to donate their, their time for the rest of their lives and so on. Just as we shouldn't expect doctors to, or nurses to do it, we shouldn't expect patients to do it. So that's a little bit of my, you give me an opportunity to vent one of my pet peeves, but there you go. I think a number but of- it, Yeah, I think it's engagement's important, but there are limitations to it. A number of points there that we'll wanna pick up, I think, in the panel discussion, so. Uh, thank you, Andre, for your contribution. Thank you.